Welcome. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to our event uh, today at noon. Um, I'm Amelia Haviland. I'm a professor at Heinz College, um, and I'm speaking for CMU's whole committee on health disparities in the time of COVID. Uh, first, thank you uh, for attending our panel. There are many demands on everyone's time, and we appreciate your making the choice to be here with us. The COVID pandemic has shown a spotlight on and increased public awareness around health disparities. Dean Krishnan tasked our committee with creating programming for the CMU community on solutions regarding health disparities in collaboration with the CAUSE Center at CMU, that's the Center for African American Urban Studies and the Economy. Our committee's efforts have been fully collaborative. You can see the committee members down at the bottom of this first slide. Uh, between the students, staff, administrators, and faculty on the committee, and I thank everyone for your time and input as we've been uh, putting this programming together. Okay, let's move right to our panel. Today's panel is one in a series of events co-sponsored by Heinz College and CAUSE on this topic. We're really excited. I've been really looking forward to this panel um, uh, to hear from our panelists. We have with us four Heinz College alumni uh, who have leadership roles in different types of organizations where they are out there making a difference, being part of creating and implementing creative solutions to reduce healthcare disparities. Uh, these folks have generously agreed to share their experiences with us, um, and I'm really uh, looking forward to that. I'm gonna move now introducing, into introducing all four speakers, and then each of them will, will share a little bit, um, and then we'll move into the, the uh, question and answer part. Uh, with our student moderators. Um, so the first speaker will be Dan Lavalley, and he's the director of the UPMC Center for Social Impact. Among his responsibilities is leading UPMC's Pathways to Work program, which provides workforce training and educational opportunities to individuals who are on Medicaid. Dan also works on partnerships to serve people with intellectual disabilities, and he leads UPMC Health Plan's LGBTQ health programming and related initiatives. Before joining UPMC Health Plan, Dan ran for Congress in 2014, becoming one of the youngest people in recent decades to do so. He also led the merger of United Way of Butler County and United Way of Southwestern Pennsylvania. Dan serves on the boards of directors for the United Way of Southwestern Pennsylvania, United Way of Pennsylvania, and Community Health Services. He's chairman of United Way of Southwestern Pennsylvania's Butler County Local Operating Board, and he was recently appointed by Governor Tom Wolf to the Slippery Rock University Council of Trustees. In 2019, Dan was named one of Pittsburgh Magazine's 40 Under 40, we're all familiar with, and managed healthcare executives, 10 emerging leaders. Dan earned both a master's degree in healthcare policy and a bachelor's degree in policy and management from CMU. And he lives in Pittsburgh here with his wife and their daughter. So he'll be our first speaker. Then we'll move to Aaron Dalton. Aaron Dalton was recently appointed to be the director of the Allegheny County Department of Human Services. This is an integrated department with a budget of nearly $1 billion. It includes five programmatic offices, the Office of Aging, Behavioral Health, the Office of Children, Youth and Families, Community Services, and the Office of Intellectual Disability. Ms. Dalton has held policy positions within the Allegheny County Executive's Office and the United States Department of Justice and was an adjunct staff member at the Rand Corporation. Ms. Dalton is a board member of Neighborhood Allies and was a mayoral appointee to the Pittsburgh Civilian Police Review Board. A lot of policy around that right now. And a county executive appointee to the Allegheny County Juvenile Detention Board of Advisors. Ms. Dalton received a master's of science from Carnegie Mellon University, Heinz School of Public Policy. Next, we'll move to Jada Shirell, is the Chief Executive Officer of Healthy Start Incorporated. It's a public health organization that focuses on improving maternal and child health 
and addressing the disparities that lead to higher rates of infant and maternal mortality among black women and babies. As a past participant of the Healthy Start program, Jada is very passionate about addressing black maternal health through education, outreach, research, and advocacy. Jada's collaborative work with local, regional, and national maternal and child health partners includes serving on Pennsylvania's Perinatal Quality Collaborative, the Pennsylvania Perinatal Partnership, the Best Allegheny Equity Team, and supporting the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine in developing educational content focused on health equity. Jada is also involved in the establishment of a fetal and infant mortality review process in Allegheny County. With 18 years of nonprofit development and public involvement and project management experience, Jada's niche areas are fundraising and focusing on collaborative processes that lead to community level change. Jada is trained in human-centered design, strategic doing, and is a certified lactation counselor. She's a graduate of Heinz College at Carnegie Mellon and the Earl Graves School of Business and Management at Morgan State. She is also a graduate of the local Coro Center for Civic Leadership Leaders in Learning program, completed the EDGE Leadership Program, and is a previous honoree of New Pittsburgh Couriers Fab 40. Jada is also the owner of J. Sherrill Consulting, which offers an array of services primarily to nonprofit organizations around the theme of capacity, creativity, and collaboration. Our final, final speaker is Peter Mann King. Uh, Peter serves as the program manager for Swedish Health Services LGBTQI plus initiative. The LGBTQI plus initiative is a one year initiative to conduct a current state assessment of the care Swedish currently provides to the LGBTQI community. And based on these findings to provide recommendations to Swedish for future programming and services. In addition to managing the LGBTQI plus initiative, Peter also is developing a system-wide service line for gender affirming care and hiring a healthcare navigator to support the gender diverse patients that seek care at Swedish. Peter earned a master's degree in healthcare policy and management from CMU and a bachelor's degree in Latin American studies and Spanish. He serves on the Gay City Seattle LGBTQ Community Center Board of Directors as co-chair, where he's actively setting long-term strategy for the organization. He lives in Seattle, Washington with his partner and enjoys running, hiking, and playing volleyball. All right, without further ado, I am gonna turn this over to our panelists and our student moderators. Uh, Dan, will you get us started? Sure, absolutely. That's right. I don't know. Do you want me to just kind of get going on some of the questions that we had and, and how we do that? Or, or are there some you want to start with? Yeah. So thank you all for joining us today. And thank you to the panelists for being here today. So just to get started, I just wanted to get an overview of um, all the panelists experience working in health disparities. So just some general questions about how your how does your organization work to address health disparities? How, have, how has this changed uh, with COVID? And then kind of trying to get like an understanding of a trajectory. What did you learn at Heinz that kind of helped with um, the work that you're doing now and what have you learned since? So it's a lot of questions, but if you could um, share more about that, that'd be great. Sure, sure. So I can start certainly on, on the first part. And I know we, I'll keep it to eight to 10. I'm watching the clock. I know we got to roll through it. I'm so sorry. I have to leave a little early as I was telling the buddy on before. We've got a big day in my family. My wife is swearing in as a the federal court soon, which is really cool, big in her family and ours. But um, to start, so again, I'm, I'm at UPMC here, and, and I honestly like to just do whatever would make Erin happy, quite frankly, because, you know, she's the greatest, and, you know, we, we have a lovely relationship with, with the county and others. But here's a quick overview of where we're at at UPMC and within the health plan. Um, so I'm on the health plan side, which we've got about 4 million members across the state, and then in um, other states, you know, across the region. So recently, and this is right before the pandemic, and it's helped us especially tackle some of the disparities during the pandemic, we launched a new uh, Center for Social Impact that's all laser focused on how we can help our members especially meet their social needs. You know, we know that you can't be thinking about going to the doctor if you don't know where your next meal is going to come, or if you've lost a job, 
um, and can't provide for your family. So for us, it's all about how can we figure out programs that will work to help our members meet their social needs, prove that they end up working um, within overall healthcare costs and provide better quality and better care, and then work to build more of those programs you know, throughout our service area, especially keeping in mind serving our most vulnerable. So we serve um, the vast majority of our members that we have are on Medicaid to some degree, um, either with income, disability, or they're duly eligible for Medicare as well and have many challenges, um, whether it be housing supports, work supports needed, food, disability. So, you know, we really have, have come to the point where we wanted to create that kind of special center. We've been doing this work for years. Um, it kind of wasn't always the number one priority around running the business, but now we have this and we've moved it. So I'll talk about kind of two kind of specific um, areas and where we've targeted disparities during the pandemic. So we'll either look at a target population or a, a, a need. So like, you know, one in particular, our members with intellectual disabilities, before our partnership with Aaron, where we were able to work a bit more with the county, we had really no idea which, you know, who our members were that were receiving supports um, for individuals that, that had um, intellectual disabilities. And now that we do that, we've focused quite a bit on how we can make sure that our care gets brought into the overall system for how individuals receive supports and services. So we've been able to you know, prevent emergency room visits and other hospitalizations, especially during this time, and help support those uh, organizations like Achieva and Mainstay and others right here who are providing such unbelievable care. So that's kind of one area, but then the other is looking at a, a, a need or a disparity or a determinant, however we might want to kind of address it a little bit. And you know, one, again, is a wonderful program we've had um, with the county and then a couple organizations here, um, one in particular in the Strip District, around how we can help our members who are homeless. And of course, during the pandemic, we've seen more and more um, you know, become homeless or are housing insecure, sleeping on their friend's couch, staying with a family member, not sure where they're going to be you know, going for the months and, and, and years to come. So we've worked to build a program there to combine the housing supports with kind of the medical and the care coordination supports that we have out of the health plan. And it's worked really well. We just uh, kind of have opened up a, a new um, eligibility for that program. So it's not just individuals who are kind of on the streets, but people who are struggling to, you know, who are staying with a family member, um, you know, not really sure where they're going to go next. And then the other kind of big one, and then I can go to some of the hide stuff a little bit is, you know, how we've really looked at um, a job. You know, one in three Pennsylvania workers have filed a jobless claim since the pandemic started, which is insane. I mean, I can't even grasp that number. So we really tried to draw a line in the sand as a, as a health plan and as a company that it's time for us to step up to help people find jobs at UPMC and elsewhere. So we created a, a small team of people um, who are here and ready to, to help people you know, navigate and find work at UPMC. We've been able to hire a couple hundred individuals off of Medicaid and cash assistance and others um, from the pandemic until now. We've provided this support and we're also building kind of new skills-based training. So it's kind of, kind of how we think about the pandemic and social needs and disparities is, you know, targeting populations, but then also kind of putting our foot down that a job is so huge. And we've tried to look at this, that helps to take care of uh, disparities in some ways. If we're making sure that through minority communities and others that we are providing this type of navigation and support where it wasn't available before, putting our money into job training programs, um, like one that we've got in the Hill District that's, you know, looking at, you know, training EMTs, um, you know, to work in communities. It's uh, called Freedom House. It's a, it's a build off the 1960s. So that's kind of how we've um, looked at this. And, you know, we've, uh, you know, loved, loved it. Lots of, lots to learn, lots of, lots to move on. Um, yeah, I would say in the you know, little, little bit of time I have left, Trey, you can, if there's other questions that you have. Um, but with Heinz, you know, the biggest thing I learned, honestly, was, um, you know, within this work was how to, uh, how to respond to failure. You know, I uh, ran for Congress unsuccessfully and, you know, it was a great journey, but I didn't really know what to do next, honestly, because at Heinz, you kind of just give everything that you possibly have to what's in front of you, you know, but then, you know, I think, um, so many people that I had uh, met along the way kind of helped pick me up. You know, I was struggling. I wasn't sure what I was going to do, where I was going to go. I put every last little bit. My wife and I moved in with my family, you know, because we pour money, everything into that. Um, you know, so honestly, you know, I learned, I learned that how to recover. So any of you listening on the phone, honestly, you, know, you have your ups and downs. You can certainly come to me. I've had a several downs. So we're always happy to talk, you know, and, and be through that. But just to respond and be passionate and and knowing that I was never even closest to the smartest person in the room, but if you could figure out a vision and articulate that, there would be, you know, smart and wonderful people who you can bring with you to, to kind of make some change, you know, and, and that's what I've taken, 
you know, into this large organization that I work now. And, uh, you know, that's what I'll always take forward. So those are a couple of things, right? What, what, what else would you like me to hit on in the few minutes I've got left? Yeah, I think that's a really great um, introduction. And just wondering kind of about, you're talking about like some of the work you do with the county. So um, what are your thoughts on kind of these like connections between like a, an organization like UPMC and like the public sector? Yeah, I mean, so a couple in particular, and Aaron can, you know, can can say good or bad, you know, <laughs> our partnership, but we have, we're so grateful to her and the leadership that, that she's provided because we've now been able to see and understand more about our members than we ever had before so we could collaborate and make sure we're doing what each of us do best. And that is just the most beautiful thing. I haven't seen anything around the country like what we have, you know, with, with, with the county from a plan and, you know, the, the kind of just leadership from a government perspective. And then I would say another one, we would be nowhere in this pathways to work journey if it wasn't for partner for work, which is the public workforce system here in Allegheny County and other workforce boards. We just linked up with them. You know, they are providing support to our members and people in need and we have the jobs. And then we also have kind of that other wraparound. So the biggest thing that I learned and learned this at Heinz a little bit, but now in practice is like, there is just, there are connections to be made if you just are willing to be kind of vulnerable, say what you don't know, make that connection and try to find a, a way forward. And I think we've done that in some ways we can always do better, much better. Um, but there is a, the, without that link, you know, we're not, uh, we're not doing our job. So, you know, I would say that's the biggest thing I've learned and uh, to find people you trust and find people that trust you and build that, I think is, you know, that's what gives us hope for, you know, the future and knowing what you don't know. That's an, another thing I learned at Heinz that's helped me now. A lot of things I didn't know and just to be straight about that and find people who you can work with to get to the ultimate goal. Thank you, Dan. And I think definitely during these times, we see a lot more collaboration between the public sector and organizations like yours. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and before I move on to asking Erin more about her experience, I just want to let everyone know that you can um, ask questions in the Q&A box, and then we'll ask those towards the end of the um, meeting today, so around like 1245. Okay, so Aaron, I just want to, going off of kind of what um, Dan said, I was, wanted to hear more about what your organization is doing to address health disparities, especially during COVID and kind of the lessons you've learned at Heinz and since Heinz that has helped you in your work. Great, thanks. Um, excited to be here. Thanks for including me. I can't I can never match Dan's energy level. He's he's actually always that excited. It does seem like a big day in his family, but I, I mean, he's just actually always that excited, um, which is is a good positive thing. Um, so uh, the, I, I'm at the Department of Human Services. I'm not actually quite the director. I'll be the director. Today is my boss's last day. So I've spent most of my time at DHS running analytics and technology policy planning stuff. Um, and at DHS, while we don't, I guess it's to say we don't work directly on health issues. Everything that we do, um, you know, affects health and is really sort of at, at its core a health issue. We we run child protection and aging services and work with partners from behavioral health, uh, so mental health and substance use. We we work with programs like the program Jada runs. We've got a big um, initiative with Jada now and. Both of us will see what impact. Hopefully, it has. Hopefully, it has a very good positive impact on um, reducing health disparities. But um, it's it, you know these are all these are all experiments. Um, there's you know there's really there's really so much we try to do, um, but just a couple of of comments. Um, we try, I think, first to understand the disparities. So. I, I do come from more of the, the data side and learned a lot of that clearly at, at Heinz um, and, and to publish, be open about, about information. So um, for students and folks who don't know, if you go to Allegheny County Analytics, you will find a wealth of data tools and reports and infographics that you know, didn't, didn't exist before that help to understand how we're doing on various services and certainly disparities in those services. We, we publish things that are controversial um, and important like looking at the, um, the pathways between school and juvenile and juvenile justice and the adult criminal justice system and how our services um, help or fail to help in, in those situations and, and what, can be, what can be done about them. 
Um, we, we really try, we try, I mean, you know, Jada, uh, Dan will point to me, I'll point to, to Jada um, to keep me honest. We try to listen um, and be part of the community that we serve. Uh, we, Mark um, in his leadership really invested very heavily and I'll do the same in people with lived experience really doing the work. So um, for example, we have a youth support partner unit that has 50 plus people in it who are young adults who have been in our services supporting other young adults. And this is also a workforce opportunity for them, but there's lots and lots of examples of, of us, including people with, with lived experience. Um, so we're listening to them. They have voice um, in, in our work um, and listening to the community through a number of, of other forums. We've, we've really, we really have tried to um, be responsive during COVID to, to the needs. I mean, the unbelievable basic needs um, that have, um, you know, this pandemic has laid bare just how close people were to the edge of really needing food, really needing rental assistance, um, and, and really needing lots of other basic needs like technology, for example. Um, we, we, we turned around pretty as quickly as we knew how. Uh, the rental assistance programs we ran initially were not perfect. There were lots of challenges in the way that came down to us, but try to try to, to learn and hopefully we'll do better with, with round two, but got a lot of money out the door. Um, have been since the beginning providing devices and hotspots uh, to people in, in need um, and our clients and trying to um, um, who are trying to participate in school and treatment and so on. Um, made new partnerships around food. It launched in like a couple of weeks. And this was, a, this was the community's idea, it wasn't our idea. Um, 62, I think 62 learning hubs throughout the community so that um, kids could have a safe place to go and do remote learning and parents could, could survive, you know, get a break for, for some time so they could work. Um, and so on too. Um, I don't know. There's there's lots of lots of other stuff, but the um, in COVID too, we worked pretty hard with to push um, and help and support a new health department director. You know, um, she walked in the door her first day of work, which was before she was intending to start. Um, you know, COVID was full swing, and helping to improve the data quality that we had around around COVID, uh, testing and access to testing and cases. Um, using the data resources we have, we were able to like increase, I don't remember the exact percentages, but increase the um, amount of data we had on race by like 75%. I mean, otherwise we really couldn't have talked about race, for example, in COVID testing, COVID cases, COVID hospitalizations, because it was missing. Um, and so we were able to work with her on that. And that, that just starts the pattern of like, First, you have to understand, then you have to make it available, then you work with the community to help um, to, to try to have solutions. I will nod back to Dan for sure. Not easy for a health plan and a health system to, um, to sign an agreement like that one they did with us to, to share data, um, but I think they just saw the, the impact that it could have on patients and the community. And so they're the only ones we're unique, but it's also they're unique in, in their willingness to step forward. Nobody else in the region um, or elsewhere has done that either. Um, and I'll just say for on the hindsight, I mean, I think I think I have to just point to the to the data side, right? So like I, I learned none of this, none of the things I learned are, are useful anymore. Um, um, and as as technology and, and analytics continues to to change, um, but the way of thinking about data and technology. And um, I, I certainly learned at Heinz and we continue to hire lots of Heinz analysts and I think we'll have some openings now even. I, we can, uh, Sylvia knows I, um, um, I go and bug professors up, up at uh, CMU for candidates with some frequency. So let me, um, let me stop there and, and um, see if there's anything that I missed or you'd like me to address. Yeah, thank you so much for that overview. I think it's it's really um, helpful to know kind of like how expansive the skill set at Heinz can like help you even as you navigate throughout your career. So um, and just like new technologies and things like that. Um, so I was wondering, you talk a lot about um, how 
how like using technology to like improve um, kind of like how you uh, like interact with the community. So I was wondering um, how, how does that play a part in terms of looking at um, health disparities like now with COVID? I know you said like race and things like that. Are there any other areas? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot more we can do. Um, so one thing we haven't solved and most people haven't either is really improving access to care by allowing people to share their experiences with care with one another. Um, you know, like it's it's a maybe overused example, but if you want to find like all the great places to eat wherever you are, you can read all kinds of reviews and figure out what is the right thing for you. The same thing doesn't exist with services. And so um, I think, you know, working with community and with people, we can, we can um, improve the ability for people to help one another to find services, for example, and that's a certainly an area um, I want to invest in. Um, we've certainly taken big, like significant moves, uh, good or bad. Uh, I guess the world will will reflect later, but we've tried to do it ethically um, in in the use of data to help make decisions. And so um, we. And I think, I, do, I mean, the evidence so far suggests to me that we are using those data to help reduce um, disparities. Um, so for example, we, we previously um, didn't use data in this way to, to uh, help prioritize people for homeless, for housing services rather. So housing is a really scarce good. Um, it's an expensive good. And if you're and you should have good systems to identify who would, um, who who should who should receive that housing. And so we use a predictive risk model there, and I think that will show that we're um, serving more of the right people, people at significant risk for things like emergency department visits and jail bookings and so on. Um, and and we're trying big big um, big moves with that in the prevention space um, to help offer services earlier. Um, because we want to reduce the coercive parts of government. We don't want child welfare involved in people's lives. We don't want, we want to, I want to pull back the criminal justice system significantly. Um, uh, but we're using data to help drive some of those efforts. And um, so, you know, I, I, it's, 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 it's groundbreaking and it's controversial. Um, and, but I, I do think we've tried to do that work with the community. And this is, again, another place Jada can, can keep me honest, so. Thank you so much, Erin. Yeah. And so now, um, Jada, since it seems like your two works really interconnected, um, I'd love to hear more about how your organization is helping to reduce um, health disparities during COVID and then kind of your, like the learnings you took from Heinz and how that's helped you in your work. Yes, definitely. Well, first, thank you for the opportunity to be here um, and to speak to um, this audience and to be a part of this panel and to talk about the work of Healthy Start. So um, our mission is to improve birth outcomes and, and to look at the Black-White disparities in infant and maternal mortality um, across various levels. At the individual level, what supports and education do families need in order to be healthy um, within our organization, looking at um, our frameworks and how equitable they are. And then at the systems change level, how do we coordinate with systems um, such as the county DHS, such as UPMC and other um, health plans and, and health systems and look at you know what not only people's individual behaviors, but how are the systems impacting them? And so we, we use a social determinants of health framework. Um, so we can't talk about health disparities, which are preventable differences in people's ability to be healthy without talking about racism. And so as a public health organization, um, with, first of all, as a, as a Black woman-led public health organization, we are very intentional in uplifting um, the work of other Black women in this space, in the space of birth equity. Um, and so Dr. Kamara Jones, who's an epidemiologist, um, defines racism as the structuring of opportunity and assigning value based off of race. 
um, that causes some people to be lifted up and other people to be held back. And so um, that is kind of the, the fundamental definition that we use in doing this work. How are systems structured so that some people are advantaged and others are disadvantaged? And so we're very intentional in, in how we interact with our families and with community, keeping that in mind. It's not all, it's not even largely about the individual behavior. It's much, much more about the, the context and the social determinants. Um, I was in the Healthy Start program, the, the program that I now run. Um, it is a national program. It is a federally funded um, program that started 30 years ago, looking at, again, this, this deplorable um, thing called infant mortality, and that's a baby dying before his or her first birthday. And in the United States, we really have a rate of infant death that is not on par with you know, our investment in healthcare, our investment in services, um, the technologies that we have, there is no reason that infants and women should be dying at the rate that they are. So we've been trying to tackle this for a really long time. Um, we have seen improvement, but not to where we would like to be. And so if we look at a measure of our nation's health and a measure of how um, we treat people, you know, our ability to, to make sure that an infant is healthy, um, that, that would be a pretty strong measure of, of how well our country looks at its health. Um, so that's how we approach health disparities. So at the individual level, at the community level, um, we provide services in the community for families. Um, we do a lot of broad-based community education, again, around health disparities and social determinants. Um, we provide services to those families who enroll with us. So we go into their home, we support them prenatally. Um, really advocating for doula services. So that, so that is um, birth support. That's a non-clinical form of birth support. Um, that families know the options that they have for their care. So you may want to deliver your baby at home. You may plan to do that. You may plan to deliver at um, a birth center, the midwife center. You may plan to deliver at one of our local hospitals. Um, but making sure that our moms have choice, that they are not um, coerced into unnecessary medical treatments. We have a much higher rate of cesarean birth than we would like to see. Uh, we have a much higher rate of cesarean birth among Black women uh, that we would like to see. And a lot of times, Folks don't know that they have a choice, that they can speak up, that they are, um, someone is paying for their health care, whether they're paying out of pocket through an employer plan or whether they have Medicaid, which is a health care um, insurance type. So making sure that our moms know their rights and know their options. And then we work with lots of folks um, throughout Allegheny County at the state level and nationally um, who would like to see just people be healthier. And so, you know, we we're really maternal and child health focused, but that intersects with child welfare. It intersects with um, just our general preventative health care, how a woman goes into her pregnancy impacts what her pregnancy is going to look like and also impacts postpartum, um, making sure that folks know, for example, really jarring statistics. So if a woman has a heart related complication during um, during her pregnancy, so that could be preeclampsia, hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, she is six times more likely to have some heart related disorder later in life. And heart disease is the number one killer of black women. And so we really take a life course perspective in our work. And I will say that while we have a focus on um, black women and, and infants and families, because that is where we see the disparity, our work in thought leadership um, uplifts outcomes for all women and for all babies and families. Um, at the systems level, again, we're working, for example, with UPMC and McGee Women's um, Research Institute to make sure that uh, services are accessible. We're partnering with them on our doula service. We launched a virtual doula intervention in response to the pandemic. So when we were hit with the pandemic in March of last year, um, and things began to shut down, hospitals were looking at their policies for who, who should be in the hospital and really restricting, for good reason, we wanna protect everyone's health. But when someone is going into a hospital to give birth, they should have the option of having um, the people who are most important in their lives there to support. And so at the time, and I think it, this is still the case, McGee was allowing one support person. Um, so if you had a partner, 
um, and a doula, for example, only one of them could physically be there with you. Um, also, we found some moms did not ha even have a partner. So we launched our doula program, which allowed for virtual doula support for those moms who wanted it. And um, for those who had no support, the doula could come in person. We provided PPE, um, we provided iPads so that we would be sure that mom had a secure connection during her labor and delivery. She didn't have to use her own device or worry about her own data plan or things like that. Um, so that was one of our on the ground responses. And as a result of that, um, over the past year, the doula program has grown. Um, even awareness of what doula services are has grown. And the fact that we're able to offer them free of charge to women who need it most is, has been really important to us because there is not um, a payer system for doula services. So those services in, in our community for those who need them most have been um, kind of spotty because we've been relying on, you know, foundation funding here or there that, that can come and go. So we're really working um, at the state and federal level to say, how can we get Medicaid to reimburse doula services? We provide lactation support. Um, so that's another area where we see a huge disparity in outcomes between black and white women, rates of breastfeeding initiation and duration, um, breastfeeding, is a public health issue. It's not simply a preference. Uh, we promote breastfeeding. Uh, obviously, we promote um, doing what you have to do to, to feed your baby. Not all women choose to breastfeed. But for those who choose human milk feeding, um, we want to make sure that they are able to meet their goals. And so it's not, um, it's not always an easy or straightforward process. There's a lot involved in it. And we support our moms in, in going in that direction because it is it is a health issue. And it also breastfeeding um, reduces the infant mortality rate. So that's again, another reason that, that we promote that. Um, some of the work that we're doing at the state level as part of the perinatal, um, the PAPPC, there's so many acronyms, the perinatal, um, Quality Collaborative with the Jewish Healthcare Foundation is looking at hospital practices. So again, I think it's really important that while we put, um, we recognize that individuals need support and they need resources um, and training and, and information, we also look at how our systems are working. We can't continue to be a system where um, some women come into the hospital empowered and um, feeling like they have a good connection with their doctors and their medical team and feeling heard um, and having a good experience. And then we have another group of women who um, are traumatized, feel that they're not heard, um, feel that, you know, things have been done to them and they've been harmed physically and emotionally. And so we have to look at, at the history of medicine in our country and um, even the history of gynecology and how black women slaves were experimented on without anesthesia and you know how that set the foundation for modern gynecology. And, and it goes so, so much above and beyond that. And so when we look at COVID and research, Erin um, made a good point about investing in lived experience. And so that's not um, a courtesy, that's a best practice. And so our organization is very intentional in investing in lived experience as a, as a balance to um, the data. So the data is really important, but so are the stories. And so we invest in lived experience, um, but we encourage our moms to be open to being involved in research. But we also feel that research needs to be um, inclusive at the onset. And so the last thing that I'll say about um, investing in, in lived experience as a um, as a, a core practice and as a best practice is it's important in our work that we have those who have the lived experience leading the work. Um, and really quickly, my time at Heinz was fabulous, um, made lifelong friendships. I, I did a management track. Um, I didn't do a health or health policy track. So I had no inkling of being in this particular um, space of public health when I was at Heinz. But um, if I could go back, I wouldn't do it any other way. Thank you for sharing that, Jada. And it's really, it's really interesting work, and I think really relevant to all times. And thinking of now too, it's really especially important. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, and now I'm going to go to Peter. 
since you both work in healthcare, it seems like, it seems like there's probably a lot of connections. Um, so Peter, if you can just talk about your um, work and how that relates to health disparities and also um, how that work might have cha um, changed at all due to COVID. And then also finally, if you can share your experience at Heinz and how that connects to your work or things you've learned. Definitely, and, and thank you for having me. It is the morning here over in Seattle, Washington, um, but I believe the afternoon over in Pittsburgh, and it's wonderful uh, to connect, reconnect back to the, the Heinz and CMU family, so thank you for having me. Um, my name is Peter, my pronouns are he, him, his, and uh, I work for Swedish Health Services, which is one of the largest not-for-profit health uh, systems in the Seattle Puget Sound area uh, with hospital system and a medical group and specialty care. So we have uh, pretty much almost every type of care across the spectrum when thinking about medical and some of the behavioral health pieces. Um, and so when thinking about health disparities, you know, I think Jada, Dan and Aaron have all touched on a lot of the key components that you can talk about. And, and I love that there's, you know, even the call out of, of listening to the community leaders, because I think that's where we started with the LGBTQI plus initiative, which we hope to really formalize and turn into a long term program. And so, you know, I serve on a community uh, center, LGBTQ plus community center um, board, and so have been com connected to the LGBTQI plus community. But I will say, you know, taking on a new space within a health system that a lot of this has already been highlighted historically has not been a, a place for many folks uh, to access, uh, really started with rebuilding or starting to build the trust and relationship with our community. So I think that was fundamental to addressing any disparities before we even started to look at the data, started to look at um, what information we had internally, um, but to really start um, with our community and our community leaders to better understand where we need to look and how we need to look uh, when thinking about a program and services and really uh, a holistic approach to, to healthcare and wellness as well. So some examples of that uh, in a health system, if you think about all the complexities of technology, data, systems, processes, and, and so forth, uh, we started to look at um, our EPIC system, our electronic health record system, of course, for our population health data. Uh, similar, I think, what uh, Aaron mentioned to race data, uh, it, it will be surprising that we actually captured and, and figured out that we only capture about five to 12% of our total patient population with any sort of sexual orientation or gender identity data. So uh, that is obviously not a, a representative sample of the over 800,000 patients that we serve in the Puget Sound area. Um, and so that's one of the key pieces I'll say that really got our leadership's attention around if we truly believe in health disparities and serving our LGBTQI plus community and all of our communities because sexual orientation and gender identity is not a single issue or, or singly important to the LGBTQI plus community, then we will better serve all of our patients. Um, and so that's one example of kind of what we brought to our leadership to get attention and, and some of our buy-in with the current state assessment that we've conducted. And on top of that, when listening to our community, our community leaders, we've actually had many listening sessions also with our, our youth. We Swedish runs a teen uh, health center in a few of our high schools. Um, so we've been able to go in and listen to our LGBTQI plus youth talk about healthcare, how they want to be included and involved and lead their healthcare. And so thinking about not only the systems, but also how we can redefine those systems. So you know, the fact that gender identity is many of the times binary in many of our places at the federal and state level. Uh, a lot of the things with the pandemic, for instance, like with our immunization reporting in Washington State, Washington State only collects male and female from most of our vaccination data. And so we've had a lot of internal conversations about how do we best capture gender identity 
uh, when it comes to um, the binary fields that our, our state and also CDC is requiring in those reporting. How do we best capture that? How do we also acknowledge that those are not representative of, of our community that we serve? And what language do we use to also invite people uh, to recognize that and, and also provide feedback and, and who they are. So that's one example too during the pandemic that this, um, this important work that we do is also brought to the forefront um, with advocating at the state level even around changing systems and, and of how we capture uh, that data um, to better advocate again on behalf of our communities. Um, in terms of Heinz, I've, I've highlighted a lot of that, you know, I think through systems, um, and the and the familiarity with data, I would say that's really been uh, the most helpful for me in this new role. Um, I've gone through a lot of different uh, places in healthcare since Heinz and previous Heinz. So been in the global health, community health, uh, public policy. I worked for the Government Accountability Office for a few years after um, Heinz, and then most recently was doing quality improvement and um, safety work for Swedish. Um, so all of those things uh, connect in and, and better understanding how we capture data, how the systems interact um, has really informed all of the work that we do to better connect it to not just LGBTQI plus issues, but issues that will ultimately improve the health and well-being of all of our patients in the community we serve. Uh, one other example which I've been working through is, you know, through our HR system. So as we think about the third party and all of the technologies that all of our organizations uh, contract with, uh, it's also important to bring best practices through that. And so one example that I'll just share too of how systems work is uh, we contract through um, probably 20 or so different systems for hiring. I'm currently hiring a, a healthcare navigator to support our transgender patients and gender diverse patients uh, to better access our gender affirming services that we already provide. Um, but we believe that we need a leader and somebody from the community to help navigate those services internally as we build capacity. However, and uh, through our hiring, again, we operate off of a, a binary system of male and female. So if we truly want to recruit and invite people into this space, uh, a lot of this is also rebuilding and reimagining as we go through the system. So how do we add other gender identity options? Why does that then show up in some of our external facing um, when you're looking for providers uh, on our external website, that there are only two options and how those all interconnect. And I think, again, Heinz really had helped me understand databases, how those interact, and also the familiarity, familiarity to move between all of the different pieces, operations, you have product managers, you have database managers, and be able to interact across the, the spectrum uh, of all of the different service lines and groups uh, at Swedish and, and uh, across the different groups. So I hope that answers some of the questions and I, I definitely wanna get to some Q&A with this panel as well, because I know there's a wealth of knowledge too. Yeah, thank you so much, Peter. And I think that the um, pinpointing like the small areas where you notice like, like you said, the um, gender binary and the recruiting and seeing how that like points to a larger systemic error. So I think that's really important. And I think that's something that probably a lot of the panelists share um, in terms of systemic change. So now I wanna get to the Q&A. Um, I see that there is a, um, I'm actually gonna direct this to Ethan to, ask the questions from the Q&A. And then um, if there aren't any more questions after that, then we can go back to more general questions, but continue to um, input your questions in the Q&A and they'll be asked right now. Thank you. All. Yeah, great. So thank you again to all the panelists. It was great to hear about all of your experiences. This is a question for all of you. So what is on the top of your wish list? in terms of actions to make a positive impact in the community, whether it is increased funding, implementation of a specific policy, et cetera. What is one thing that you feel needs to happen to improve people's lives and health? And what is the path to making that happen? And any of you can start off with this. I mean, yeah, I'll start, this is Aaron. And I'll just also note, there were a couple of specific questions about predictive analytics that I I answered in the Q&A. And um, anyway, I'm just, I just wanted to note that. 
Um, I, I mean, I, 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 I would, I, the things I would want are really around more unconditional cash transfer, universal basic income. Most of what we really deal with um, in human services is just the, the needs people have. Like, you know, people want this whole child welfare system. I, I mean, and we do need a child welfare system to protect those kids who are really at, in, in have safety issues. But most people just need basic resources that for lots of issues, including um, systemic racism, they haven't, um, we haven't provided access to. And so um, if I could wave magic wands, um, I would, I would want, you know, healthcare for folks and you know, universal basic income and, you know, testing on conditional cash transfer to help solve problems for people rather than all of this stuff we put together. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tita. No, no, go ahead. We're playing the unmute or not unmute. Um, I'll just I I echo what Aaron said too. I think what we found is you know there is a tremendous amount of uh of wisdom and strength and knowledge within the communities that we're hoping to serve, and if we can empower and remove as many barriers uh, to gatekeeping to being able to, for them to truly live uh, through, you know, Gay City, the org that I, you know, on, am on the board, we, our mission is liberation, self-determination and joy. If we can achieve that for the communities that we are, are attempting to serve um, by, by providing the resources and, and reducing the barriers, whether it be, you know, insurance gatekeeping around needing multiple letters for gender affirming services, being able to even have uh, gender affirming services that are covered as medically necessary uh, and not needing to, to have to go through traumatic experiences, but to, to be able to access uh, everything without needing to, again, vet and go through a checklist and reconfirm um, all of those things. If we can truly just give the resources and and um, and all of the things that we uh, have uh, to the communities to really uplift them. Um, I think that's really my wish list: is constantly paying people for their life experiences, paying people to be involved uh, and and also uh, involved in the process and decision making, and then also essentially just removing every type of barrier that we can think of um, when we look at the systems and and what people have to go through and to access the services that we are working so hard uh, to for all of the communities we serve. Yeah, I would just say to, to go off of what Peter said about gatekeeping and removing barriers. Um, and this is, you know, it's, it's hard to pinpoint one thing, but um, health and housing go hand in hand. I think when we look at like, you know, go back to undergrad and psychology 101 Maslow's hierarchy, most, there are a lot of people that don't even have their basic needs met. And sometimes to get to those basic needs, they have to navigate, um, systems that are unnavigatable for them because they're going through so much. So like housing, um, health, when a, a maternal child health is, is really health for everyone, but it's not only about someone choosing to reproduce, it's also about how healthy were you when you were 12 years old? Um, what happened in your life earlier? The ACEs, you know, adverse childhood experiences, trauma, um, so it's all, it's, it's really hard to pinpoint one thing because everything is so interconnected, but just not having so many barriers for people to get what they need and barriers being navigating systems, but barriers also being barriers in our minds about who deserves what, like everyone deserves healthcare. Everyone deserves somewhere to live. Everyone deserves mental health services, not just those who can afford them or those who know how to navigate a system or those who, are willing and able to wait on the phone for two hours and be on hold or whatever. So that's that's my two cents about that. Great, those were very well put answers. Thank you. I have one question for Peter specifically. In what ways do you continually engage community members and leaders to start and improve programs outside of the team listening sessions? And what strategies did you use to get buy-in from administrators who may not consider LGBTQI plus a priority? Very good question. Um, so 
uh, beyond listening sessions, we've met with about 12 to 15 different uh, community-led organizations that either are founded by LGBTQIA plus communities or uh, predominantly serve LGBTQIA plus communities. So Seattle, uh, I think, is one of the top, you know, pop, um, uh, kind of has the top population within uh, the uh, uh, nation with LGBTQI plus communities. And because of that, we have so many leaders, national leaders uh, located in our area. And actually Swedish is located in the historic LGBTQI plus neighborhood as well. So it's not hard to find folks that are our neighbors and actually just ask them, what should we consider? what is our reputation now and how do we really work to improve that um, and a lot of the answers you know are maybe not the 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 ones we want to hear but it really is essential to to um, pull those in from from a wide variety of folks you know we're trying to include every community to spirit fafa fine uh, are black are um are Latinx and, and all of these communities that already have much of the data available for us. We don't need to re-ask them, but we just need to bring them into the table um, and, and help us inform our leadership around what the community is asking for. Um, the other piece I would say that we've uh, engaged, uh, there are two pieces. So we have a caregiver resource group at Swedish that we've reinvigorated around LGBTQI plus um, caregivers. And so we call our employees caregivers. Um, and that's a space that we are keeping that group informed and also at the table to advise what services and programming we should be thinking about moving forward as well. We are also setting up a patient family advisory council of LGBTQI plus patients to be uh, advisors and leaders in the space that we recommend as well. So all of these pieces are um, adding into the listening session um, and, and again, uh, playing a key factor into kind of where we're looking at and, and what we're highlighting um, to our leadership as well. As far as sharing with leadership, <laughs> there are a lot of different ways I think you can highlight uh, health disparities. For LGBTQI+, I think the most uh, unfortunate situations that, that proves a point is through compliance and discrimination. So because we have access to all of these data sources and we actually have to report out on compliance, discrimination is quite a, a I think a very straightforward way to show that we have a lot of work to do um, for the patients that we serve, whether it be from misgendering patients uh, to uh, uh, not allowing them um, the services, you know, not calling them back and, and showing that we uh, have work to do internally for training as well. Um, so that, you know, from a discrimination standpoint, unfortunately, um, has been one of the, the key methods to say we have a lot of work to do and uh, we need to dedicate resources to this. Um, on the other flip side for leadership, um, I think it's, you know, an ask and being able to, to say that caregivers, physicians, all of our staff are looking for more training and support in this area and to be able to show that that is not just a single issue, it shouldn't just live in one clinic or one place in the organization, but that it's really an ask across the organization from our frontline staff of nursing, receptionists, all the way up to our medical leaders and, and different clinical leaders in the organization. And so being able to highlight that and bring those voices to our leadership has been really helpful as well. Great, thank you. Those are all the questions in the chat. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you to our panelists for joining us today. It seems like we're out of time for final comments, but uh, I see Aaron posted a link in the chat on more um, information and things like that. Um, so thank you all for again for joining us. Thank you for the wonderful questions from the audience. Um, and I'm really excited to just see the work that you all are currently doing. And it's really inspiring to just see that even during these challenging times, there's people such as yourselves doing this kind of work. So thank you all again for joining and enjoy the rest of your Fridays. <laughs>